Hey there kids, we um, are finishing up chapter 3 and beginning chapter 4 in the Oddmeyer book 1, The Changeling. A fellow don't come out of the deep dark the same man who went in. Again, the old man's eyes bore into tin. Have you ever been to the deep dark, sir? Tin's voice came out like a whisper. Old Jim's icy gaze rose, and his lips turned up in a sneer. At the very heart of the wildwood, past the Oddmire, in the thickest part of the deep dark, they say there's a nest of thorny vines so dense and sharp they catch any fool enough to stumble into their grip. Not even light escapes from the bramble. Tim barely noticed that Cole had climbed out onto the limb of the apple tree behind him. Tin's forgotten hat was hanging inches away from Cole's fingertips. So, old Jim concluded, slapping his tool chest closed, next time your brother decides he's scared of whatever's watching from those woods and he goes running home, you'd be wise to join him. Tin's eyes shot from the old man to Cole, who was suddenly dangerously dangling from the branch in plain sight with the hat clutched in one fist. He grinned triumphantly and waggled the hat at Tin until he almost lost his grip, swinging wildly for a moment before catching hold of the branch again with both hands. Old Jim sniffed and spat, then began to turn back towards the orchard. Cole froze, trapped where he hung. Wait, Tin said. Old Jim paused and raised a bushy eyebrow. What um do you what do you think it was? Tin asked. What do you think might have been watching us from the woods? Hmm, Jim nodded sagely. All kinds of ghouls and oddlings in those woods. People used to say that the founders brought the spirits of the old country with them when they moved to Edinburgh. Spirits of the old country? That doesn't sound so bad. There's a reason the founders left the old country, kid. Still, if there's one thing you best hope is watching you from the wildwood, it's the queen. Tin shuddered. He hated these stories. The queen of the deep dark, mother of monsters, the witch of the wildwood. Some say she eats errant children, Jim continued. Others say she turns them into wild animals. Some say that she can transform at will into wild animal herself, the cloak becoming the hide of a great beast. Some say she planted the bramble years ago, or else the vines are her terrible fingers reaching out to snatch boys and girls who tread too far from her forest. A tree branch crackled like a rap rifle shot, and Tin jumped. His heart was pounding. He had lost track of Cole, and now he couldn't see him anywhere. Old Jim spun around, scowling, and plodded into the orchard. Tin's mouth opened and closed, but he could not think of more to say to stall the farmer. Step by agonizing step, old Jim stalked up to the tree, and then around it, and back. Darn dear. Of course, he did say a different word, but I won't be saying that. You can read it the whole book. They knocked down my fence just this morning. Looks like they've been helping themselves to my apples again. Tin let out his breath. Hi, called the voice from behind him. For the second time, Tin jumped. Cole laughed as he came jogging up the path. Cole, I, you, I just got back, Cole winked. From home. Right, yes, because you were at home. I brought your hat, dummy. We really should get going. Right. Yeah, well, have a good day, sir. Sorry about the the deer. Old Jim grumbled and shook his head as he watched the boys jog away. That's the end of chapter three. And here is the beginning of chapter four. You almost got caught, said Tin, punching his brother in the arm. We almost got caught. Cole chuckled. It's not fun unless you're ne almost, uh, it's not fun unless you almost get caught. No, it's way more fun without getting caught. 
and way less scary. Old Jim gives me the heebie-jeebies. Tin couldn't help but keep glancing out at the tree line as they walked along the forest edge. How come you always got to push your luck anyway? Well, I don't know. Cole kicked a dirt clod. It just feels good to prove you can, I guess. Like you're special. Don't you ever feel like you've got something hiding inside you that you just want to... Cole trailed off. You know. They walked on in silence for several paces. Tin knew. Everybody knew. They knew, but they didn't know. The boys had grown up surrounded by stories about fair folk and oddlings. And the story that the boys knew most intimately was the story of them. The story of what was hiding inside one of them. Sometimes, Tin could swear he felt it prickling just under his skin. Sometimes, Cole was sure it was humming in his bones. They both wondered if they were the one. They both worried. I just want to be special sometimes, Cole said suddenly. I want to be a hero like Hercules, doing all those labors we had to read about for Mrs. Silva's class. I just want to prove I can do, I don't know, big things, scary things. Hercules was a twin too, Tin recalled. He had a brother called Isosceles or something. No, Iphicles? I don't think I read that part, said Cole. Did his brother get to go <clears> on <throat> cool adventures and kill monsters and stuff too? Um, I don't think so, said Tin. Maybe? He wasn't a demigod like Hercules. I think he was just a person. The stream was up ahead, and Cole began scooping up pebbles as they walked. Tin leaned down to pick up a few, too. Do you think he wanted to? said Tin. Wanted to what? said Cole, picking bits of bark out of his handful of rocks. The brother. Do you think he wanted to fight monsters and stuff? Of course he did. Why wouldn't he? Cole asked. Well, I mean, Hercules didn't really want to do any of it, did he? He didn't want to wrestle lions or kill Amazons or clean poop out of an old stable. He just did it to make up for some really bad stuff in the past. He just wanted to go home. I don't think he ever wanted to be a hero at all. I think he just wanted to not be a monster. They listened to the sound of their own footsteps scuffling along the dusty path for a while. Hercules didn't clean poop, said Cole. Did so was one of his labors. That's gross, Cole laughed. You're gross. They drew up to the bridge and Cole nodded. Ready? Tin shifted the pebbles in his palm. Three, two, one. They tossed all the pebbles at once high into the air and watched as they came down with a satisfying flip, flip, flippity splash, flip, bloop, into the stream. Cole leaned over the railing to watch the cloud of sentiment, sediment drifting up under the water's surface. Maybe Hercules would have liked doing his labors more if he had brought his brother with him, Cole said. Tin did not reply. His gaze was on the forest. Just as the boys had thrown their pebbles, he had caught sight of something. There, in the shadows at the forest edge, had been a pair of eyes watching from between the leaves of a wide bush. The bush swayed and then was still. Tin swallowed. He wanted to go home. And that's the end of chapter four. And that's the beginning of chapter five. And we'll read that next time.